presenter, but more just the um, introducer. So some of you may know me already. I'm Melinda. I'm the OT consultant at Pearson. Um, but today we have two invited speakers, um, and they're actually two authors uh, of the Petticat. So there's a, a number of authors, and these are two of them. Um, so I'd really like to introduce first Helene Dumas. So she is the director of the Medical Rehabilitation Research Centre at Franciscan Children's Hospital and an adjunct faculty part-time lecturer at the Department of Physical Therapy, Movement and Rehabilitation Sciences at Northeastern University in Boston. Um, so uh, Dr Dumas received her Bachelor of um, Science in Physical Therapy um, at Boston University and she also has a Master of Science degree in Human Services Administration from the University of Massachusetts and a Doctor of Physical Therapy from Northeastern University, also in Boston. Uh, so Dr. Dumas has worked as a physical therapist or physio in clinical and admin roles in programs providing services to infants, children, youth and adults with disabilities in various settings, including early intervention, public and private schools, home health and post-acute hospital care. Um, so Dr. Dumas is a senior author of The Pedicat and her research has focused on outcomes of pediatric post-acute post hospital care and evaluating the psychometric properties and clinical use of the pedicat. So we also have um, presenting today, Maria Pinkham. And I'm just looking for Maria's information. I'm very sorry, had it right here. Maria. So Maria um, Pinkham is also a physical therapist or physio and manager of research and quality improvement at Boston Children's Hospital in the physical and OT department. At the time that the pedicat was developed, Dr Pinkham was a clinical researcher in the Medical Rehabilitation Research Centre at Franciscan Children's Hospital. She received her Bachelor of Science degree in physical therapy from Northeastern University and an MS in Human Movement Science from the University of North Carolina and a DPT from the uh, MGH Institute of Health Professions in Boston and a DS DSC from the University of Oklahoma. She's worked in a variety of clinical pediatric settings including early intervention, schools, home care and hospital inpatient and outpatient programs. In addition, she's developed community and hospital-based adaptive sports and fitness programs for children with special needs. Her research interests include developing and evaluating paediatric outcome measures and evaluating the effectiveness of physical therapy interventions. So I think you'll agree that we're in very good hands with our presenters today um, to tell us about the pedicat and also how the test can be used in clinical practice and also in research. So without further ado, um, let's hand over to the authors and hear what they have to say. Thanks, Helene and Maria. We'll be covering a webinar using the PDCAT in clinical practice presented by Helene Dumas and myself, Maria Fregala-Pinkham. What we'll be covering today, we'll briefly discuss uh, the applications and features of the PDCAT, and then Helene will present two cases to look at um, results of the PDCAT and use in clinical practice. The PDCAT uh, was released in 2012, and it is an expanded and revised functional assessment based on the original paper and pencil version of the Pediatric Evaluation of Disability Inventory, or the PD. It uses computer adaptive testing technology. The PDCAT is intended for use with children and youth ages birth to 21 years of age. The PDCAT can be used across all diagnoses, conditions, and settings, and focuses on activities and participation in life tasks. Due to the nature of the computer adaptive testing, the PDCAT is brief yet precise. The PDCAT was developed um, to look at identification, to identify functional delay, to examine improvement for an individual child after intervention, and to evaluate and monitor group progress in program evaluation and in research. The computer adaptive testing uses artificial intelligence to select the most relevant items from a bank of validated items 
Each item in the bank represents a different level of difficulty from most easy to very difficult um, to perform. And the IRT is a statistical method which is used to scale items on an easy to difficult continuum. It provides a framework for modeling response data, um, which provides item estimations and interval level scoring. So basically IRT modeling is used to evaluate children without depending on the same item. So you don't have to have the same items to administer to each child because it uses this prediction based on the person's abilities on the items that were administered. So when administering the PDCAT, no special environment, materials, or activities are necessary since it really focuses on the child's typical performance. The respondent may be a parent, a caregiver, or a clinician who's familiar with the child's performance. The PDCAT can be used on multiple occasions for the same child. So initial interim discharge follow-up, and it can be used frequently with um, no minimal time requirements between assessments. So there's two versions of the PDCAT that can be administered and the user selects that version each time a new test is, in, is started. So for the speedy version, it's really the fastest way to get to an accurate and precise score. And it's usually, you know, it, 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 it includes about 15 items or less um, unless the respondent selects an I don't know response and they may get slightly more than 15 items. The content balance version administers more items with four or more items per content area. So that's better suited for patients that are in the middle to high end of the ability level um, because of the hierarchy of some of the content area. And I'll show you that in the next slide. So um, let's see, I also wanted to point out that in terms of an exception uh, to this rule in the mobility domain for the first item that's administered stands for a few minutes. If you if the respondent selects unable, then only items from the basic movement and transfer content area will be administered, even if, as you're doing the content balance um, to make it uh, relevant to that, the, that patient. Um, also, the mobility domain has a separate wheelchair subdomain for manual wheelchair users who propel uh, manual wheelchair. Um, it's not a CAT, it has 12 items and all 12 items are administered. So here's the item map and that is produced after the, the PDCAT is completed. And basically you'll look on the left side of this item map are a list of all the items. In the gray bars are the content areas. And then on the right, you'll see the scoring as to how that was done with the IRT and calibration. So on the bottom is the scale, 20 to 80 scale. Um, and you can see on the very bottom in that um, gray area, uh, you know, you probably can't read it on this slide, but it says basic movement and transfers. And you can see how that content area is shifted left. So those are easier items. So if you have a patient that um, is maybe just doing some basic stepping and not doing a lot of walking, then you can see on the very top, the running and playing or the next content area down, the steps and inclines, those item calibrations or level of uh, difficulty scale are shifted to the right and are more difficult. So you can see that a child may because of content balance, they might receive items or they will receive items from that content area and they might not be the most relevant. Okay, here's an example of a score report and Helene will re review these in much more detail. I just wanted to point out on this, the FIT score, which is circled in blue, a negative 4.24. So um, this means that the items don't quite fit the model in terms of the item responses. So what you would expect, um, the items that you would expect um, or the, the answers that you would expect are not um, revealed in, in the um, administration. So for example, if a child walk is able to walk three miles and it's easy for them, then you would expect that the respondent would also answer that it's easy for them to turn their head from side to side when they're in a supine position. If they said it was that it was easy to walk three miles, but it was difficult for them to turn their head from side to side, then that 
um, that along with other uh, um, answers and items might give you a high fit score. And if you do get a high fit score, meaning a negative 1.63 or lower, then you would look at those items and see what is trying to, what is kicking that out? What seems to be the outliers in that? And are those, were they responded, were, were those items interpreted the way they should have been interpreted or is there an error? Sometimes there might be an error where somebody might say, oh, I said, I said the opposite. It should have been easy and I said difficult. So do you just want to do a check back on that? Okay, so normative scores. Um, you will also receive normative and scale scores generated when the PDCAT is completed in the, um, in the software. The normative scores are based on a child's chronological age and can be used to compare a child's functioning relative to other children of the comparable age. Uh, the PDCAT normative scores are provided in age percentiles and T-scores. So just one thing I wanted to bring up in terms of percentile ranges were developed using a different methodology than what was used for the T-scores. So there may be some occasions when the two types of scores do not correspond exactly. So when using the PDCAT scores for service eligibility decisions, we recommend that the child be identified as eligible if either the T-score or the percentile range is below the criterion. All right, so scaled scores, they're um, on a 20 to 80, 80 scale, so they're not comparable to the PD. They are collapsed, um, and the scale scores are not ad adjusted for age. Um, they provide an indication of the performance of a child along a continuum of, relative, of easy to more difficult items. Uh, the higher score means that the child's performance of functional skills or level of responsibility is greater. And scaled scores are recommended to track functional progress in children not expected to catch up with same age peers. So I'll give you an example of that. So here's the example of um, comparing normative scores and scaled scores. So in this example, Lizzie's initial test one, PDCAT mobility normative scores were at a T-score of less than 10 and an age percentile of, le of less than fifth percentile and they ended up being the same for test two. So these scores indicate that Lily's mo Lizzie's mobility skills um, or function is well below that of her same age peers for both test dates. However, if you look at Lizzie's scaled scores for test one was 56, while her score at test two was 64, indicating that while she has not caught up to her peers, she has made positive improvement over time. And what you can do is you can use the standard error to calculate a confidence interval. So for example, for test one, you could take the standard error, which is 1.3, um, multiply that by two, you get 2.6. And so the confident in interval, the 95th percent confidence interval would be 53.4 to 58.6 for test one. The 95th uh, confidence interval for test two is 62.6 and 65.4. Those do not cross, so you would, you could be confident that that test is um, re, uh, re, is improving and not measurement error. Okay. There's also an autism spectrum disorder module, um, and that you would, as you you select, um, you get this selected by choosing yes on the demographic page to the question um, if a child has been diagnosed with ASD. Basically, it's the same in terms of same versions. There's content balance, there's speedy options, same domains, four, four domains, but there are some item and scoring differences. So for the mobility domain, there are no differences at all. It's the exact same. For daily activities, there are eight additional items in the item bank. For social cognitive, there are eight new items and 11 revised items. So some of the wording is done differently. There's some hints and um, suggestions for parents to review or respondents to review as they're answering the questions. In addition, there are some minor changes to the scaled score. So there are some items where a child with ASD actually maybe did earlier than a, than a typically developing child and then the reverse. So you would expect maybe uh, in terms of eye, content, uh, eye contact, for example, was one item where kids with ASD scored much um, 
lower in um, and later than, than kids with um, without ASD. In terms of responsibility, there are eight new or revised items, wording or direction changes. Okay, so normative scores, T scores and age percentiles. Those actually remain the same for the PDCAT ASD because even when you're comparing to the typical kids that we're going to compare them to anyway, they they did score, you know, they scored differently. So they're still delayed, even if they may have done one item maybe earlier or whatnot, they still do not score as you would expect. But where you do see the changes is in the scaled score. So there are some changes in the scaled scores and they're adjusted to better reflect how um, a child with ASD performs. Um, so there might be um, in terms of the spacing of, as you saw on the item map um, or the ordering on the item map might be slightly different um, or not might be, is slightly different on the social cognitive um, scale domain. Okay. All right, and now we're ready for the cases. I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, and I will start sharing. All right. Okay. Well, Maria and I have prepared cases uh, to demonstrate the administration of the PDCAT, as well as the interpretation of the results. And we hope that um, we'll be able to point out some key features of the PDCAT for clinical practice along the way as we're going through these cases. So going through the cases, I'm going to use the Q Global platform. Um, some of you may be familiar with, or some of you may be um, you know, interested in using it. So you'll, you'll have a demonstration of what the um, Q Global uh, use of the PDCAT is like. All right, so the first case, well, we're gonna talk about David. Uh, <clears throat> David is a 10-year-old male diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder at two years of age. His past medical history is otherwise unremarkable. David currently lives at home with his parents and younger sister. He attends school, receives OT and speech therapy services. David is angry, eats by mouth, and speaks in full sentences. All right, a little bit more about David so you can appreciate his PDCAT scoring. He's described by his parents and teachers as follows. David requires frequent redirection to remain focused on a task or with a topic of conversation. David struggles with academic, cognitive, and fine motor tasks that he is not interested in. David frustrates easily. He demonstrates reduced physical endurance and avoids participation in gross motor activities. And lastly, David demonstrates reduced safety awareness. For example, he will wander and he will talk to unknown adults. So why would we use the PDCAT with David? Well, in this example, we'll say that he's due for a reevaluation of his therapy services. So the PDCAT will provide us with a comparison of functioning to, the same, to his same age peers, and will also provide an objective measure of his typical daily function. I'm going to go to the Q Global um, screen now. So for some of you, this may look familiar. I am signed in. I have David. Um, in my system, um, you'll see here that, you know, as with his demographics, I've put his birth date is uh, April 4th, April 9th, 2011. He's 10 years, one month of age, and he's a male. I'm going to assign a new assessment for him, and I'm going to assign him the PDCAT. So if you're familiar with Q Global, you know that you can either um, do it in person on your screen or you can send a link via email. So obviously for today, we're gonna do it in person online on our screen. And here I get to choose the domains that I wanna do for David um, for the PDCAT. So I wanna um, note that I'm gonna choose to do um, the daily activities domain and I'll do a speedy version for him. I'm gonna uh, skip the mobility domain. I'm gonna, um, it's, for David, it's not as um, important a, um, a domain to, to examine his functional. And so I'm gonna um, go on to and do social cognitive. And for social cognitive, I'm gonna choose to do content balance. I want more information um, about that um, functional domain. 
I think I'll also include a responsibility assessment for him. And again, I'll do the speedy. Remember, the speedy is going to give us up to 15 items per domain. The content balance is going to give us up to 30 items. I'm going to choose to do it in English. I'm a clinician. And so I'm going to, I'm continuing with the demographics. David does not use a walker, crutches, or cane. He does not use a manual wheelchair. He does not use a power wheelchair. But yes, he has been diagnosed with ASD. And by selecting this option, I'm going to get the ASD module for daily activity, social, cognitive, and responsibility. I'm going to launch my assessment for David. Okay, and here is my welcome to the PD cat. Here's an opportunity to confirm the demographics. And again, diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, I said yes, I want the ASD models modules for his case. Okay. This is the instruction screen. Um, for the daily activities, we'll be using this, um, this scale to rate um, the child's typical performance. We'll be rating them as unable, that the child can't do it, doesn't know how or is too young. It's hard. It, the child does it with a lot of help, extra time or effort. The functional skill is a little hard. Child does with a little help, extra time or effort. Or it's easy. The child does it with no help, extra time or effort, or his skills are past this level. There's also the I don't know option, which Maria mentioned earlier, which if chosen, just basically acts as a skip and the program will provide a, a different item um, in its place. Okay. There's some frequently asked questions if anyone has it, um, confusion about how to respond. Well, let's get on with, with David's assessment. So you see here the first item for daily activities is pulls open a sealed bag of snack food. That item, whether or not you are using the ASD module or just the um, regular PD cat, will always be the first item in the um, assessment. Depending on how you respond to this item, just like throughout the rest of the test, will dictate what item you get next. So for David, we're going to say he's 10 years old. We've described him. He's a 10-year-old male with ASD. We're going to say this particular functional skill is a little hard for him. The next is puts on and fastens pants. This is also a little hard for him. Inserts laces into sneakers or boots. I'll say that David is unable to do that. Fastens a belt buckle. Also a little hard for him. Tucks in a shirt or blouse, also a little hard. Next item we get is pulls open the tab on a soft drink can. We'll say this is hard for him. Next, we have pours liquid from a large carton into a glass. Again, we'll say this is hard for him. Puts on a t-shirt. Say so for David, this is easy. He can do this. Puts on socks. Again, this is easy. He does it with no help, extra time, or effort. Oh, but putting on winter sport or work gloves is a little more challenging. So he does need a little help, extra time, or effort for that item. Here it's asking about squeezing a plastic bottle to obtain ketchup or syrup. We'll say this is hard for him. Puts on and buttons a front buttoning shirt. It's a little hard. Connects and zip zippers, also a little hard. Cuts vegetables or meat with a fork and table knife, a little hard for him. And opens a door lock using a key, also a little hard. Okay, so that essentially, we'll, we'll see the score report, but that is the end of the daily activities domain. I'm gonna guess that we had 15 items um, that were administered for daily activities and that will generate a normative as well as a scaled score for daily activities. But since we chose to do additional domains, the PDCAT goes right on to those next domains. So here is the social cognitive. And again, it is the same response scale but there are no pictures for these items. Um, and again, there's additional directions and information for how to respond if people have questions or want additional information before proceeding. So I'm gonna go ahead to the first item. 
The first item in the PDCAT ASD scale domain is explains reasons behind actions such as why he or she spent money on a particular item. This is unique to the PDCAT ASD um, module, module um, in the social cognitive for the typical uh, regular PDCAT, it is a different first item. I think it uh, recognizes numbers on a clock or phone. So it's a little bit different here for the um, ASD module. I will, we chose cogn uh, content balance because we wanted more information um, in this domain. So I'm gonna go through these a little bit fast um, so we can get through the, through the demonstration of the PDCAT and get, and get to the score report. So we'll say this is a little hard for David, but at least you can have a, um, a sense of what some of the items are. Follows complex written instructions. We'll say this is a little hard. Finds a phone number, a little hard. Asks for a change in plans or responsibilities in a respectful way. We'll say this is also a little hard. Teaches another person a new game or activity by giving examples and explanations. Now, David, this is a little hard. I mean, this is hard. He does. He needs extra help, time, and effort. Writes short notes or sends text messages and emails. A little hard. Uses language appropriate to the situation. Again, a little hard for him. Uses a map to plan a route to a new place. Also a little hard for him. Counts out the correct amount of bills and coins to pay for an item costing $20 to $40. A little hard. Checks traffic in both directions and knows when to cross the street. Here we're going to say this is hard. He needs a lot of help, extra time, and effort, as you heard um, with his case description and his lack of or limited safety awareness. Ask permission before using someone's property is a little hard. Tries to resolve a conflict with friends or classmates. This is hard for him. Describes what help is needed to solve a problem. Say that this is a little hard for Dave. Maintaining friendships. This is also, um, this is actually hard for him. It really requires a lot of extra support and, and help with that. Stays quiet in public places when expected. Also hard. Accepts advice or feedback from a teacher, coach, or boss without losing his temper. That's a little hard. Accepts the need to wait an hour or two before a request can be met. Again, that is hard for him. Uses words, gestures, or signs that non-family members generally understand. There's some additional um, instruction here. We'll say for David, though, this is easy. When David's upset, responds without punching, hitting, or biting. That's still a little hard, even at 10 years of age. Transitions from one familiar activity to another. A little hard. Sometimes he gets upset with that. Works with friends to reach an agreement when they have different ideas. This is hard for him. That social piece is very hard. We're about two-thirds of the way net through now, uh, social cognitive. So uses the words uh, yesterday, tomorrow, today correctly. Easy. Language is um, a strength for him. Uses strategy when playing complex games. It's a little hard. Tells others when he or she does not understand what they are saying. Also a little hard because of how frustrated he gets. Communicates ideas in a two to three page written assignment or report is hard. Follows written directions of two to three steps. It's a little hard for him. He takes turns and follows rules with while playing simple board, card, or video games. It's a little hard. Counts out coins to pay for an item that costs a dollar or less is also a little hard. Carries on a conversation with a familiar person by listening and responding appropriately. Let's say it's a little hard for him. And uses a watch or clock to be ready for an activity such as catching the school bus or watching a TV show. He also needs a little help and with this. Okay. 
So that completed the social cognitive domain. And again, that was longer because it chose the content balanced version of the PDCAT. So it gave me up to 30 items to generate a score for um, David. So lastly, we'll do the responsibility domain which basically is assessing how much responsibility the child takes for the activities that are presented. And we rate the child's typical performance using um, a five point scale now, ranging from the adult or caregiver has full responsibility and the child takes no responsibility to the, um, back to the end point where a child takes full responsibility without any direction, supervision or guidance from an adult or caregiver. And in the middle, we have the adults and the child share responsibility about equally. So a few extra um, points of instruction and some frequently asked questions and answers here for um, additional information. So the first item that comes up is choosing and arranging own social interaction. David is unable to do that. His adult caregiver has full responsibility for that having all the items that will be needed before leaving home for the day. David can take a little responsibility for that. So we'll say that the caregiver has most, but he takes a little. Planning and following a weekly schedule. So all activities get done when needed. So David does um, is able to identify what needs to be done. Um, and he's able to help just, um, develop a plan and make some adjustments, but we'll say that the caregiver still has most responsibility. Planning. This is following a recipe or cooking instructions. For this, the caregiver still takes full responsibility. Using utensils such as a knife or grater or safely during food preparation. Um, David is cautious around sharp objects. Um, he does some has some safety awareness issues, but it's not not evident in the kitchen. So we'll say that there um, they share responsibility about equally for this. Following health and medical treatments, he's 10 and his caregiver still takes full responsibility for this. Developing and following a plan to reach a specific goal. The caregiver still does this with David. Testing and adjusting water temperature before taking a shower or a bath. In this case, the adult has most responsibility. Packing all the items needed for an overnight stay, again, it, David, David takes part, but the adult caregiver does most. Maintaining the security of his home. The adult caregiver has, takes most, has full, I'm sorry. Um, determining the safety of a new location, such, an, as such as an unfamiliar neighborhood. The adult caregiver has full responsibility. Managing kitchen appliances. The adult has full responsibility. Keeping track of and completing homework assignments. David is starting to take a little responsibility, but the adult still has most. And keeping track of personal belongings throughout the day. David shares that with, his, with an adult caregiver, whether it be his uh, parents or his teachers. Okay, so we have now completed three domains for the PDCAT. I'm gonna close that. And I can, it says I can close that window. So I'm going to go back to my Q Global sign in. And I'm going to go back to David. And I'm going to generate a report for him. So here it gives me, it tells me how I administered the PDCAT, on what day, how old he was, and I can proceed to reports. I'll select a PDCAT report and create it. I will download and open it so that we can look at his skills. Here's the cover page if you haven't seen a PDCAT report. Again, some demographic information. And here's the summary score report that you saw um, on Maria's slide. You'll see here that the domain is identified and the ASD, the fact that we use the ASD version is also identified. The date of administration. Then we start with the scaled score and the standard error. So we'll see along the continuum of the 20 to 80 scale, you can see where David's got, board here um, from between 46 and, and 68 for across the three uh, domains, although each domain gets its own score. Um, then the standard, and here are the standard errors. David's normative scores, his T-score for daily activities was a 22, and he's in the first percentile. So significantly um, 
below his same age peers. For, uh, his T-score for um, social cognitive, which appears to part um, in some aspects as a strength for him and other aspects as a significant weakness, he scored a 35, and he's in the seventh percentile for his age. And lastly, for responsibility, he's got a T-score of 31 and is in the third percentile. This is the FIT score that Maria talked about. They're, they're reasonable scores, so none of the um, responses that we provided were, were appeared to be too um, out of the picture for David, if you will. Um, we answered 15 items for daily activities, 30 for social cognitive, and 14 for responsibility in order to generate this score. I signed on as a clinician. He has no device or wheelchair, and this is the type of PD cat um, that we use. That is um, an example using the PD cat uh, for David. If you are, as we said, trying to um, you provide doing a reevaluation and determining should he continue with services, this would certainly provide you with um, evidence and objective data to show that he is significantly beyond below functioning below his peers um, with the T-scores, and the um, scaled scores would provide you with um, an objective measure that you could use then to compare over time. The other part of the um, score report that we should look at very quickly is the um, item map. So for each domain, there is an item map. There, here's the daily activities ASD item map. You see the content areas along the left-hand side, you see his scores, the scaled scores up across the top. So in daily activities, there's home tasks, keeping clean, getting dressed, eating and mealtime. We did a speedy version. So we didn't even, we didn't get many um, items up toward the top. We, we tended to get most items here in the eating and mealtime and getting dressed. And that's based on the responses that we gave to the items. Again, you can use these to look at what others, where, are his um, strengths, uh, weaknesses, what um, items is he more successful with, what items are that are perhaps at the same level of difficulty, but yet he's having more difficulty with. Um, so here you can see, insert straw, no. nope, sorry, pulls open sealed bag of snack food. We said that was a little hard, but yet squeezing the plastic bottle was um, was hard for him. So there's a little bit, you know, they're very close in terms of the hierarchy, but there's some discrepancy in terms of one was one was certainly harder than the other. All right, here's the social cognitive map. Um, we because we chose content balance, we got items in self management, interaction, communication, and everyday cognition. So we made the the program uh, selected items in each of these content areas. And here you can see they were a little um, more diverse. And that certainly, um, with the profile of this child, I'm not surprised to see that. But again, it could help with some um, program planning and thinking about some of the um, activities you might want to address um, during intervent your intervention. And this red line is the, just indicative of the scaled score and the gray bar around it, the um, confidence interval, the standard error on each side. And here's the responsibility um, item map. So very similar, but again, all of the items. So we didn't, we didn't respond to all of the items, but you can see them here. Okay. All right, I'm gonna move on to our next case. Um, we, in the interest of time, Let's see here. We're going to quickly talk about. Um, let's see, we're going to quickly talk about Kathy. All right. So Kathy is a seven-year-old female with a diagnosis of cerebral palsy with spastic diplegia. She lives at home with her mother and her older sister. She attends school where she receives PT and OT. She is a gross motor function classification system level three. It means she walks with a handheld device. She has a manual abilities classification system level two. She handles most objects, but she has reduced quality and or speed. So why use the PD cat with Kathy? Different diagnosis, different age, but still very appropriate for her. So for Kathy, we want to determine the continuation of services and do some intervention planning. And again, it'll give us that same information about how she's functioning in comparison to her same age peers and to have an objective measure of typical daily function. 
I'm going to go back to my um, Q Global screen. There we go. Okay, and I'm going to find Kathy. Here she is. So I've put in her some of her demographics. Here's her birthday. She's female, but I'm going to assign a new assessment for her. I'm going to quickly go through again. This time we'll stick with speedy, mo speedy uh, daily activities and, and speedy mobility. Um, so I have a clinician. She uses crutches. She uses a manual wheelchair and she propels herself. She does not use a power wheelchair and she does not, she has not been diagnosed with ASD. Okay. Make sure we get through. So I'm gonna speed through a little bit of some of this that we've already seen. So here's the, again, daily activities and it is the same response scale that we saw um, with our prior case. So for Kathy, pulls open a uh, sealed bag of snack food. We'll say this is a little hard for her. Or she's seven years old, spastic diplegia, um, manual ability classification system level two. Uh, pulls on, puts on and fastens pants. This is hard. Tucks in a shirt or blouse, a little hard. Fastens a belt buckle, hard. Pours liquid from a large carton into a glass. She is unable to do this. Puts on a t-shirt. This is easy for her. Now let's see, I said easy for that. If I go back and you go, oh, sorry. I said easy. And you can see the next item I get is puts on winter sport or work gloves. Let me go back and change that and say, what if she was unable to put on a t-shirt? Oh, I still get the same item. All right, well, let me go back and, and change it since it is um, putting on a t-shirt is easy for her. We'll, we'll look for another one. Puts on winter sport or work gloves is a little hard. It's hard for her to put on a and button her shirt. Oops, hard. Puts on socks is a little hard. Connects and zip zippers that are not fastened. This is a little hard for her. Uses a knife to butter bread and spread jam is hard. Cuts vegetables or meat with a fork. That is hard for her. Inserts laces into sneakers or boots and she is unable. Okay. So those were all of her daily activity items. We'll go on to mobility. Just I'm going to again speed through a little bit, just in the interest of time. Um, here again is the is the rating scale. Stands for a few minutes. So Kathy is, um, uses crutches for walking. This item says, please do not consider the use of walking aids. But she is able to stand for a few minutes. But it is a little hard for her. She needs a little a little help, some extra time, or some extra effort. Now we're going to get the um, wheelchair items because we said that she propels. A, a wheelchair by herself. So she propels a manual wheelchair. So we're going to go through these and uses manual wheelchair to move from room to room and home. It's a little hard. She keeps plate, her place in the line of moving people is a little hard. She puts the brakes on and off. Also a little hard for her. Goes up and down a ramp with a manual wheelchair. This is hard. Hasn't quite mastered that yet. Uses a manual wheelchair to move quickly indoors. That is um, still a little hard for her to move quickly. She's easily able to fasten her seatbelt, but it's hard for her to use a manual wheelchair outdoors on grass, mulch, or gravel. She moves her manual wheelchair from her manual wheelchair to an adult-sized chair. And this is pretty easy for her. Gets into manual wheelchair from the floor, a little hard. Opens and closes doors to enter and exit her home while using her manual wheelchair. She's unable to do this. And pushes manual wheelchair for several hours at a family outing. She is unable to do that. Goes up and down curbs with the manual wheelchair. 
and she's unable to do that as well. So those are all of the manual wheelchair items. Everybody, if you choose to propel self in a manual wheelchair, you get all, all manual wheelchair items. Now we're back to the um, mobility items. So now we're being asked to, uh, Kathy, step up and down the curbs using a walking aid. And this is a little hard for her. She walks with the walking aid up and down a ramp, but it's a little hard. Same thing for walking on grass, mulch, or gravel and on wet indoor slippery surfaces. Now here's an item, walks down a flight of stairs holding onto handrail, but they're asking, please do not consider the use of the walking aid. So she's able to do this, but it's hard. She needs some extra help and extra time, and it takes some extra effort. Tips up and down curbs, and again, this is without her walking aid. She is unable to do that. Here's walking down a flight of stairs, stairs with her walking aid. She can, but it's hard without the handrail as well. Here's using a walking aid to get on and off a bus. It's a little hard, but she does that when she goes to school. Walks up a flight of stairs with walking aid. Again, no handrail. This is hard for her. Again, this is without, but this is without um, her walking aid. This is also hard for her. Now we've completed both the daily activities and the mobility um, PD cat for Kathy. Let's generate her report. A few clicks and I'm gonna get a report for her. All right, here's my, here's my report for Kathy. Again, she's seven, seven years of age, she is a female, and here are her scores. So for daily activities, her scaled score was a 54, standard error of 0.78, her T-score was a 33, putting her in the sixth percentile um, for her age. Her mobility, her T-score was less than 10. Um, so rather than show very, very low T-scores, we have them, um, it just listed as less than 10, and again, same for the uh, percentile. She's let in, you know, lower than the first percentile. Um, her scale score is a 56. The wheelchair subdomain, as I said, is, is 12 wheelchair items. Now, there's no T-score, because we're not expecting uh, children who are typically developing to have a wheelchair, so there's no comparison, but you do get a scale score for the wheelchair uh, items, separate than the mobility domain items. I think I failed to mention earlier that not only do you get the scores, but in when for each domain that you have chosen and you you'll see all of the items that were administered and you see the responses. So here are the daily activities um, responses. Here are the mobility domain responses. And then we get into the item maps. So here is the um, daily activities item map. You can see we got primarily items in the eating and meal time and the getting dressed. Um, content areas for Kathy. Here's her mobility domain item map. And again, we got um, very few in, um, we got none in basic movement and transfers because to the very first item stands for a few minutes, I said that she it was just a little hard for her. So it didn't push us down into these items, but rather pushed us up into some higher level items, including uh, standing and walking items and steps and inclines. Because she uses a device, there are we, we answered some uh, separate device items. You also get an item map that shows you um, where she falls on the item map using her device. You can look at how she does with her device, and these are items that do not um, that specify not to use the device. And lastly, there's also a, an item map um, for the wheelchair subdomains. You have a sense of what the scaled score is and where are the items, um, where she scored for the items within the mobility subdomain. So again, uh, separate item maps for device and wheelchair. So hopefully um, seeing the PD cat um, actually administered with, with some cases um, gives you some sense of how you might use it in clinical practice, the information that can be um, 
gleaned from from the PD cat and um, how you might use it um, both in terms of determining service delivery as well as for um, some intermittent intervention planning and also um, to track progress over time um, using the, the scaled scores. So we are looking forward to answering um, any questions you have. Thank you. Thanks, Helene and Maria. So this is a chance, we have a few minutes left if anyone would like to send through any questions. I do have some questions that have come in from people who were unable to attend live um, and are planning to watch this as a recording. So just so you know, everyone will receive um, a link to the recording after this webinar. So if you've missed anything or you want to review it, you'll be able to do that. Um, this is actually a question that I get um, reasonably often about the original PETI. Someone has asked, is the original PETI still relevant and can we still use it? So this is the old paper pencil version. Do you have an opinion about that? This is Helene. I don't, I'm hoping you can hear me. Yes. Okay. Um, we can certainly talk about that. I know people certainly still use it. Um, people are very, very fond of that measure. The PDCAT was intended to um, reduce respondent burden because doing the original PD um, as in an interview or, you know, trying to administer all, you know, all of the items and respond to all of them takes significantly longer. That being said, again, it, um, the length of time as well as the, um, the, the um, change in domains, um, we've added the responsibility domain um, for the PDCAT. Um, the, it also, the normative scores for the PDCAT go up to 21, where the original PD only goes up to age seven. Um, that being said, Absolutely, there's no reason not to continue to use the PD, the original PD, if that's your preference and that and it works for your caseload clinically. Perfect, thank you. Um, someone else has asked, and again, this is a question I've had before, could a teacher be the respondent for the PD cat? I can answer that as well. Uh, Maria, please jump in if you want. Um, certainly any uh, clinician or caregiver who is familiar enough with the child to be able to report on their typical performance can respond. Um, I'm not sure, you know, that the teacher may have enough information about some of the environments um, related to the items for the PD cat, but it's certainly easy enough to give it a give it a try or do a you know ask the teacher and and parent together to um, respond to the items. Okay, so would you say then you would send the petty cat to both teacher and parent, or would you suggest that they kind of collaborate on a single response? Um, I think either one would be okay. Um, we haven't done any type of study to look at um, comparing the validity from the PD cat um, between two different responders, such as a teacher and a parent, but that certainly would be worth um, exploring. Can you hear okay. me now? Yes, yes, we can, Maria. Okay, all right, sorry, I had my, I, anyway. So um, in terms of that question, I agree. You, in, you could actually use it for both because we know that kids do perform differently in different mm -hmm. settings. We do have evidence uh, of that, even though we have not tested the PDCAT in that realm. Um, you could see what the typical performance of the child is at the home setting as well as in the school setting um, because there are differences in the environment. Perfect, thank you. Um, we've just had a question come in from Heather who says, with the FIT score, what is considered within the normal range and when there's a negative score, what value would should we reconsider the questions? I, I can answer that, it's Maria. And um, a score of negative 1.63 or lower um, would be considered questionable, and I'd suggest you look at the item map and see what items fall um, outside that scaled score range. You'll see the the um, a bar for the scaled score, as well as um, a gray area showing the standard error bar, and see what items fall outside of that. 
and whether it makes sense as how those items are scored. It may be, um, we found in some times when there's a high fit score that it may be um, one of the items was not understood or or more so just they somebody made a mistake um, in terms of um, answering the question. So that that's what we'd suggest you looking at those patterns. Fantastic. Okay, uh, someone has asked an interesting one. If you use the speedy version on the first time round, could you use content balanced for the next administration or vice versa? That's a great question. People ask us that all the time. And um, it is stated in, in the PDCAT manual that yes, they can be used um, interchangeably, that you can use the speedy one time and use the content balance the next time and that the scores are comparable. That's great to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, here's just a question from me, actually. Um, I know with the scaled scores that the range goes from 20 up to 80, um, and it does mention in the manual that there's a little bit of leeway now to add slightly easier or more difficult questions to take that range further down towards zero or up to 100. Um, are there any plans to add any items to the pedicat in the kind of short to medium term future? We would love to do that. <laughs> so <laughs> let's just say we are trying really hard to be able to do that. As it, um, our, our plans are fluid at this point. So okay. we, we have ideas of different items, but it would, mm -hmm. it's in terms of the whole calibration um, and, mm -hmm. and testing those all out is uh, really tricky in terms of funding. Sure. I suppose the, the great thing about it being an online test is that if there were item, items added, it's not that people have to go out and buy like a whole new version of the test. It just means that it's just built into the online version, which is a real advantage of a digital assessment. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Perfect. Well, that seems to be all of the questions that have come in and we're right on 10.30, which is our official end time. Um, so unless we see any last second questions coming in, which I don't, I'll hand over to April just to wrap this up and thank you all very much for coming and thank especially to obviously Helene and Maria for giving up their evenings in Boston to talk to us today. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes our webinar for today and we hope you found the presentation informative. Have a great rest of the day and stay safe.